Okay, hello anybody? A little bit different today. I'm doing a review, but I'm going to review one of my own beers. And that sounds like a good idea, right enough. Until I tell you that this is at least a year old. It could be two years old. I can't quite remember which brew this was from. I think I tried to do an English pale a long time ago. It's all a blur now. Brexit, Covid. So, I don't know what to expect with this. I mean, that doesn't tell you a lot. It's not what it says on the packet. Uh, this is one of mine. Now then, I've got a bin down here with a bag in it, ready to catch the overflow. Because it has been known that these can have become a little gassy. But if it's a couple of years old and it hasn't exploded, how gassy can it be? Well, I guess there's only one way to find out. <laughs> I've kept it in the fridge. I might have calmed it down a bit. Here we go. Oh, no, normal. I hope this isn't the weight right. It can't be, the sediment in the bottom. Well, it is quite well carbonated. I think we can agree about that. And the problem with these is if you if you can't pour it in one and you can't tip it back again, you're a little bit snookered. That's not all going to fit in there. I'm going to have to use a second glass. I think I remember using a bit of wheat in this. Yeah, there's a bit of sediment going through here. That's the only thing about homebrew and bottles. There's a lot of wastage. Now that is really rather fizzy. I can, I can see there's a bit of dirt on the glass, it's not healthy. But you, you can tell that's generally fizzy. That, that's too gassy. That's one of the problems I have, getting the carbonation right. Sometimes it doesn't ever seem to stop. <laughs> and I think this is one of those, I think I'm gonna get a very frothy nose. Oh, lovely and clear though, by the way. I haven't got any white paper. But it doesn't come much clearer than that. I better drink it soon, otherwise it's gonna come up and over the top. <laughs> I don't smell too bad. Sometimes when beer is this old, the hops get a really cardboardy, papery. Uh, anyhow, uh, I'm gonna give this a flavour test. You know what? Even after all this time, that's not bad at all. That's quite drinkable. If it wasn't quite so gassy, this isn't a pale. This wasn't an English pale. This is a this is a hoppy IPA type of thing. I remember now. I tried to brew uh, an IPA uh, at a low a lower alcoholic content. I was going for about four percent, and I achieved that. But I managed to get a nice hoppy thing going. And I think the key to this was very late hopping. Very late. I think I put the hops in after the cold break. During the work chilling process. So I was aiming at getting the hops in at 80 degrees was the goal. Anything much higher than that and those essential oils that whatever that lovely resinous thing is, I guess boiled off. Um, but anything below 80 degrees, and now you're introducing, or you're potentially introducing bacteria, harmful bacteria, uh, to the wort. That's not a good idea. But, but at about 80 degrees, most everything's killed off. Really only be extremophiles. And if they're in your beer, you're in trouble anyway. <laughs> but a really late addition at 80 degrees, um, really works well. I mean, especially for that fruity, fruity, hoppy hit. Uh, you can smell it, and you can taste it. That's, that's a really nice beer. It's too gassy, and it has staled a little. I'd be, I'd be lying to say otherwise. There's a thing that they do when they become overcarbonated. I'm not going to be able to put that into words but it detracts from the flavours.
from all flavours. But you know, if that wasn't so gassy, I mean, I remember the ones that I drank when they were matured to perfection, and it was really very nice. It was nice because it was light and it was balanced, and putting such a late hop addition kept the bitterness down as well, which isn't a bad thing. Um, especially since this was a slightly lighter beer, a 4%, not too malty. I can't remember now what malts I put in there. I think, though, I have a little go. Slightly hard to tell now. But I think it was a certainly lager malt as a base malt. And then I think there was some Munich malt, which is quite sweet. And that also helped to offset the bitterness of the heavy hopping. And I don't specifically remember what hops went into this. I've got it written down somewhere. I might look it up and put it up here. I might. Now I recognise what the beer is. I might um, avail you of a little more information. But they were American. Okay, another squeak. If that was fresher, that really would be as good as anything I could buy. Because it's real ale. If you bought this commercially, it would have been cold filtered, and they'd have filtered all the yeast out of it, and then they would have regassed it. And that way, they can control it. They can add sugar and sweeten it if they want, they, but they can get the carbonation just right. That's much, much harder with rape. Pardon me. <laughs> Real hail in a bottle. That's a much harder thing to do. And then as a home brewer, oh, I can't control other micros getting in there, wild yeasts and the like. I'm washing the bottles around the side of the house and walking them back round and into the house. It's not a sterile environment. So I just have to hope that the yeast is the predominant factor. But I have had a problem with overcarbonation, and I think it might be because of other microbes. Because, you know, I've had some volcanoes. I call this that it's champagne when it's this gassy. That overcarbonation, it, it is the flavour that you get in champagne, but it kind of ruins the flavour of the wine. It's all, it's all you can taste is the bubbles and the CO2. And unfortunately that's the case with this and quite a few other beers that I've done, even though they weren't that old. Uh, anyway, it's an ongoing problem. And actually that is an ongoing problem, that other microbes, infections and things, if you brew in the same place regularly, they begin to build up a bit. And I think it, it can become an issue. That and the fact that the equipment gets older, and every time you wash it, it's probably a little less clean than the time before. And that could be another aspect. I could probably do with some new fermentation bins by now. Anyway, um, you know what? <laughs> I've forgotten just how well I am capable of brewing at times. And that's going to inspire me to go on to get some brewing done. I've got a load of grain and it needs using up. And you know, I've got no excuses really. I've got all the equipment and everything. I just need a bit of tidy up in the in the garage, in the brewery, and then I'm looking at brewing something light, something much like this really, and bottle it up, ready to drink in six weeks. <laughs> I must do this, and if I do, I'll probably video it, uh, or at least video the specifics of it. Okay, that's enough said. I'm going to crack on with this, very nice, very drinkable. If this wasn't at least a year old or more, yeah, very drinkable. I'd stick. I really would. Some of my better beer, if I were served it in a real ale pub, particularly since they are so crafty these days, and cloudy and everything else, it really, is, it, some of it's closer to homebrew than com other commercial beer. And you know where you are with this. There's no surprises. It's one of those that it just doesn't do anything particularly wrong. 
it's not outrageously fruity or ridiculously flavoursome or wonderfully malty or anything like that. It's a fairly pale, tame 4% American style IPA, which is exactly what I'd intended. Uh, um, a session beer. A session beer with flavour. Yeah, sticker. <laughs> and you can't always say that of my own home brew beer. You really can't. And I think it's a mark of how good it must have been that it's still reasonably drinkable. Anyway, that's about as much as I could say about this beer, what I brewed myself many moons ago. Okay, that's it for now. See you in another review soon, hopefully. Cheerio, bye.